Who is the most frightening serial killer in your opinion? Part 1 to 7. If you like this video, please subscribe to our channel Thread Tonic. Account 1. Oscar Derlewanger. He crosses the line from average war criminal to serial killer. He was a mass murderer, sadist, rapist, and pedophile who got to live out all his sick fantasies while fighting for the Nazis in WW2. In February 1942, in the bleak landscapes of Belarus, Oscar Derlewanger's unit embarked on anti-gang operations. Here, amid the frozen fields, Derlewanger's cruelty knew no bounds. Timothy Snyder's chilling account details his preferred method, herding locals into barns, setting them ablaze, and mercilessly gunning down any who attempted escape. Fast forward to the summer of 1944, Operation Bagration unfolds, and Derlewanger's unit faces heavy losses against the Red Army. Yet, from the ashes, it rises anew, reformed into a Sturm Brigade. In the heart of Warsaw, Derlewanger's horrors reach their peak. Massacres, rapes, and hospitals set ablaze with patients inside. The dates and locations serve as grim markers in a history stained by unspeakable atrocities. Edit. As a post-war prisoner, he was left in a room with some Polish guys who effectively beat him to death. Sweet, sweet justice. Account 2. Robert Berdella. Describing his murders as being some of my darkest fantasies becoming my reality, Berdella pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for the first-degree murder of one of his victims, Larry Pearson, in August 1988, and would later plead guilty to one further charge of first-degree murder and four charges of second-degree murder in December 1988. Berdella became known as the Kansas City Butcher due to his practice of extensively dissecting his victims' bodies, which he would then dispose of in garbage bags and The Collector, due to the movie which he stated was the basis of the fantasies behind the modus operandi of his crimes. Account 3. Dagmar Overby. She is a Danish serial killer and absolutely stone cold. At the time, you could adopt children from the newspaper for varied reasons. Could not afford the child it was out of wedlock. These things. And she would search these and take the payment, and within hours murder the children in the most casual way ever. Dump them in the river because it was on your way, or throw them in the furnace. One instance, a lady came back after her child because she had a change of mind. But Dagmar already murdered that toddler, so she found a lookalike, adopted that child, and gave it back. How she got caught was similar. A mom wanted her child back, and she gave so stupid excuses the police was forced to get involved. They found numerous dead babies in her apartment, but Dagmar was keen on confessing. She got the death penalty, and before this case for about a 100 years, the death penalty was just pro forma. The king would pardon you, but in this case, people really wanted her head. It was overturned to life in prison despite mob justice just waiting, but it also created entire laws to protect single mums and bastard children. To me, the scary part is that it took so deranged actions before protections of some of society's weakest was in place. Account 4. Catherine Knight. She is not technically a serial killer, but she is truly terrifying. She was the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life in prison without parole. Even her mother knew she was psychotic and warned her husband, John Price, that she could get dangerously violent. She tried to strangle her husband on their wedding night, conked him over the head with a frying pan, which broke his skull, and put her baby on the train tracks. Later on, she killed John Price by stabbing him at least 37 times, both in the front and back of his body. As if that's not enough, she skinned him and hung the skin from a meat hook, then decapitated him, cooked his body, and fed it to the kids. Account 5. Ukrainian serial killer Andrei Chikatilo, dubbed the Butcher of Rostov, he sexually assaulted, murdered, and mutilated at least 52 women and children between 1978 and 1990. Chica Tilo confessed to 56 murders. He was tried for 53 murders in April 1992. He was convicted and sentenced to death for 52 of these murders in October 1992, although the Supreme Court of Russia ruled in 1993 that insufficient evidence existed to prove his guilt in nine of those killings. 
Chikatilo was executed by gunshot in February 1994. Chikatilo was known as the Rostov Ripper and the Butcher of Rostov because he committed most of his murders in the Rostov Oblast of the Russian SFSR. Account 6. Lewis Hutchinson, insane doctor, who had his own castle in a remote estate in Jamaica. Used to invite people over, then snipe them, then drag them into a sinkhole so animals could eat them. Hanged in Spanish Town, 1723, he is one of the first known serial killers on record. Account 7. The Toy Box Killer was pretty messed up. David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer, was an American kidnapper, torturer, serial rapist, and suspected serial killer. Though no bodies were found, Ray was accused by his accomplices of killing several women, including one male with long hair who Ray mistook for a woman, and was suspected by the police to have murdered as many as 60 women from Arizona and New Mexico while living in Elephant Butte, New Mexico. Ray was convicted of kidnapping and torture in 2001, for which he received a lengthy sentence, but he was never convicted of murder. He died of a heart attack about one year after his convictions in two cases. Ray used soundproofing methods on a semi-trailer, which he called his toy box, and equipped it with items used for sexual torture. He would kidnap about four or five women a year, holding each of them captive for around two to three months. During this period, he would sexually abuse his victims and often torture them with surgical instruments, sometimes involving his friends, wife, or even his dog. Then Ray would drug them with barbiturates in an attempt to erase their memories of what had happened before abandoning them by the side of the road. Account 8. Israel Keys. He had just shy of an 11-year, that we know, crime spree. He was intelligent, completely unpredictable, and had high knowledge of wilderness survival skills. He travels for most of his killings, making him wildly dangerous. His crimes ranged from robbery to rape, and his planted murder kits are terrifying to think about. Account 9. Mac Ray Edwards. He worked for the California highways and would bury his victims where he'd later pave over them. Not all the bodies have been found yet. Edwards sexually molested and murdered three children in or around 1953. 56. He molested and murdered three more. He later stated that all of his crimes were motivated by a desire for sex. The body of one of Edward's victims was found underneath the Santa Ana Freeway, and he claimed to have disposed of others under the Ventura Freeway. Account 10. John Wayne Gacy for the perfect duplicity of it. He was outwardly considered a pillar of his community while he was murdering and raping young men. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public performances as a clown prior to the discovery of his crimes. Gacy committed all of his known murders inside his ranch-style house. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and dupe them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. He would then rape and torture his captive before killing his victim by either asphyxiation or strangulation with a garrote. Twenty-six victims were buried in the crawl space of his home, and three were buried elsewhere on his property. Four were discarded in the Des Plaines River. Account 11. Richard Ramirez. Ramirez was convicted of 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. The judge who upheld his 19 death sentences remarked that his deeds exhibited cruelty, callousness, and viciousness beyond any human understanding. No rhyme or reason, only opportunity. It didn't matter your age or gender, no consistency with weapons, he would kill you with a gun or a hammer. And he looks terrifying. Account 12. Luis Garavito. Raped, tortured, brutally murdered hundreds of children. His wiki is one of the most fucked up ones I've seen. He will be released soon due to a new law that unfortunately didn't include him. He wants to work with disadvantaged children when he gets out. Account 13. Ed Kemper. Yep. Came here to say Big Ed. Articulate, intelligent, personable, engaging, entertaining, and absolutely enormous. It could be easy to forget he is a living, breathing human monster. Edit. And if you ever listen to a book on tape from the 80s, there's a good chance it was read to you by Ed Kemper. Account 14. 
Dennis Rader, the BTK killer active between 1974 and 1991. Rader occasionally killed or attempted to kill men and children. He typically targeted women. His victims were often bound, sometimes with objects from their homes and either suffocated with a plastic bag or manually strangled with a ligature. Raider stole keepsakes from his female victims, including underwear, licenses, and personal items. He often sent taunting letters to police and media outlets describing the details of his crimes. After a 13-year hiatus, Raider resumed sending letters in 2004, leading to his 2005 arrest and subsequent guilty plea. He is currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. Account 15. Zodiac Killer for me. He used ciphers, but I don't think he was a genius. He got lucky because the different police forces kept failing to share vital information. And I think the wanting trophies for the afterlife was an act. He wasn't mad, he just wanted to be infamous. Add on the fact that he could be alive still. Laughing from an old folks' home at all the people trying to figure out who he is. Account 1. Oh, the most frightening serial killer? It's hard to shake off the terror that comes to mind when I think about the murder of Junko Furuta. The details are beyond horrifying. Can you imagine the sheer brutality and sadism inflicted upon her by those four teenagers? It's like something out of a nightmare that you can't wake up from. The thought of her enduring such unimaginable suffering for 40 agonizing days sends shivers down my spine. They called it the concrete-encased high school girl murder case because her body was found encased in concrete. It's the kind of horror that lingers with you long after you've heard about it, haunting your thoughts and making you fear for the depths of human depravity. Account 2. Robert Berdella. Describing his murders as being some of my darkest fantasies becoming my reality, Berdella pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for the first-degree murder of one of his victims, Larry Pearson, in August 1988, and would later plead guilty to one further charge of first-degree murder and four charges of second-degree murder in December 1988. Berdella became known as the Kansas City Butcher due to his practice of extensively dissecting his victims' bodies, which he would then dispose of in garbage bags and The Collector, due to the movie which he stated was the basis of the fantasies behind the modus operandi of his crimes. Account 3. I know it's pretty obvious, but Jeffrey Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, killed and dismembered 17 males. Many of his later murders involved necrophilia, cannibalism, and the permanent preservation of body parts, typically all or part of the skeleton. Although he was diagnosed with Borderline Personality Disorder, BPD, Schizotypal Personality Disorder, SPD, and a Psychotic Disorder, Dahmer was found to be legally sane at his trial. He was convicted of 15 of the 16 homicides he had committed in Wisconsin and was sentenced to 15 terms of life imprisonment. Dahmer was later sentenced to a 16th term of life imprisonment for an additional homicide committed in Ohio. Account 4. The ones we have no clue about yet. Or the ones the police are silent about, like in Austin, Texas, or Chicago. Four bodies have been found in a lake in Austin since February. And four more were found in the past year, so eight bodies total. All were male and of similar age. Currently, police are saying that it's not a serial killer case, although they aren't really releasing much information beyond that. Don't know the full details, but that's very common around the world, people especially drunken, drugged young men accidentally walking into bodies of water. But a recent pattern has emerged. The last four guys were named John, or it was their nickname. Account 5. I don't think you can ever pick one most frightening serial killer. But one case I'll never be able to forget about is from my Australian home city. I vividly remember when the story broke. The Snowtown Murders. Basically, a group of guys murdered people for little to no motivation, because they were gay or obese or a drug user or other flimsy reasons. Their victims were tortured, and several of the bodies put into barrels of acid which were kept in a disused bank. There was also cannibalism. The thing that's always baffled me is that it wasn't just one person. Three men were convicted for murder. How does that even happen? How do they find each other? If one of my mates turned to me and said, hey, you know what would be fun, killing a bunch of people? I wouldn't be all like, sure, I'm in. Account 6. Joseph Duncan. 
During his incarceration, authorities connected Duncan with the unsolved murders of Anthony Martinez in California and two girls in Seattle, which all occurred when Duncan was on parole from 1994 to 1997. In all, Duncan was convicted in Idaho for kidnapping and murdering the three victims in Coeur d'Alene, for which he was given six life sentences in federal court for kidnapping Shasta and Dylan Grown and murdering Dylan, for which he was given three death sentences and three life sentences, and in the state of California for kidnapping and murdering Martinez, for which he was given two life sentences. Account 7. One of the most terrifying serial killers in history is Gilles de Race, a former companion in arms of Joan of Arc in the 15th century. Despite his noble status, de Rice allegedly abducted and murdered peasant children, primarily boys, in gruesome acts of sexual assault and violence. Estimates suggest his victim count ranged from 140 to a staggering 800. The juxtaposition of his esteemed background with his heinous crimes makes de Rays a chilling figure, illustrating the depths of human depravity even among the privileged elite. Account 8 in my opinion, one of the most chilling serial killers is Peter Stump, known as the Werewolf of Bedburg. Operating in 16th century Germany, Stump confessed to horrific crimes, including the murder of children, pregnant women, and incest with his daughter. What's particularly terrifying is his claim of being granted the ability to transform into a werewolf by the devil. His gruesome punishment, including being put on a torture wheel and having his head displayed on a pole next to a wolf figure, adds to the macabre legend surrounding him. Stump's story serves as a haunting reminder of the darkness that can inhabit the human soul. Account 9. Spesiv Sevi family emo most frightening serial killers in post-Soviet Russia. That family consists of mother and her son, and her son had mentally problems and documentary was in asylum but somehow he got back to the home, and here he started his murders. So his mother was inviting kids to help her bring her bag to the home, and when kids came to that hell flat, no one has came back. Also, they could invite kids by two, three, even happened four kids. After son killed some of them, mother started to butcher dead bodies to make soup as food for rest of the kids. Totally confirmed, almost 40 kids were killed, but police found more than 70 sets of child clothes. That nightmare has happened because of wrong paperwork, because, as I said, Documentary Son was in asylum, and because of that, police has spent much more time to catch them. You can watch documentary film about it. Kriminalne Rosia, Sibirsky Potrashitil. Or Russian Crimes, Siberian Butcher, but I don't know if it is exist in English translation. In YouTube, you can find it by Russian title, and I guess it has English subtitles. Account 10. Leonardo Cianciulli, a.k.a. the soap maker of Correggio. She was a fortune teller in Italy and was good at playing her cards right with people who came to her for guidance about career, love, whatever it was. Killed three women between the years of 1939-1940. Made soap out of their remains, even placed them into tea cakes. And fed them to her neighbor's friends. For the last woman she killed, she placed her into tea cakes and said that hers were sweeter than the others that she made. Like what? This one chilled me. Account 11. Gilgo Beach Killer, Lisk, from NY. He was never caught. Called a victim's family to taunt them. Police tracked him one night to a payphone in Times Square but didn't find him. He is either still local living his life or moved and is still killing people. Though many scary killers are known, a lot like Dahmer, Night Stalker Ramirez, and Rod Alcala were jailed and died. They are gone forever. We don't know about the ones like Lisk. I used to take Lear, Metro North, and the subway, and would often think he could be sitting next to me. Or maybe I had a beer with him in a NY bar on game night. Account 12. Richard Chase. Ah, uh, the Sacramento Vampire. The man was completely out of his mind. His killings were particularly brutal, as his motivation for murder was to acquire other people's blood because he believed he was running out of blood. The scariest thing of all was how random his killings were. He shot a guy in his own driveway just to test out his gun. He wandered the streets of Sacramento just trying doorknobs. If the door was locked, he moved on. If the door was unlocked, he took it as an invitation and went in and killed anyone inside. He'd cut them open, consume their blood, and take their organs. 
sometimes while his victims were still alive. Men, women, children. Didn't matter. As a straight white adult male, I don't really fit the bill for most serial killer victims, so it's not something I need to worry about. But the tale of the Sacramento vampire has me double-checking the locks. Account 13. I listened to the part of the Ledford tapes the FBI used to desensitize agents. Two adult men raping and torturing a 16-year-old with common tools. I heard a few seconds of a rape that's apparently 10 minutes long. So, while I know of many a scary serial killer, my vote goes to the toolbox killers. Fucking animals. Account 14. Ted Bundy for reasons none of the others have. Every single one I could think of, if you see them or hear them talk, you'd find something is very strange and wrong with them. Bundy is the first one I point at when saying he could have easily swayed anyone he met if you had no idea of his record. Just a regular Joe who speaks exactly like a close neighbor. He'd not be a guy you'd be avoiding on the road if he'd ask. Most others on a long list, I would... I heard a story once on a Reddit thread of a guy whose father went to jail and met multiple serial killers in there. The dad had some serious fight skills, and he told his son when he got out that the only man from all of them he met, the only man who ever straight up intimidated and scared him, was Bundy. It was just a different vibe with him. He could whoop Bundy's ass in a fight, but his vibe scared him. No other man had that impact on him, and he met many killers' criminals. Account 15. Dr. Harold Shipman. He seemed genuinely like a nice doctor. But then you see his kill count. He is considered to be one of the most prolific serial killers in modern history, with an estimated 250 victims. A two-year-long investigation of all deaths certified by Shipman, chaired by Dame Janet Smith, examined Shipman's crimes. It revealed Shipman targeted vulnerable elderly people who trusted him as their doctor, killing them with either a fatal dose of drugs or prescribing an abnormal amount. As of 1st December 2023, Shipman, also nicknamed Dr. Death and the Angel of Death, is the only British doctor to have been convicted of murdering patients, although other doctors have been acquitted of similar crimes or convicted of lesser charges. Some nurses have also been convicted of murdering patients in their care. Account 1. Charles Manson. Before the murders, Manson had spent more than half of his life in correctional institutions. While gathering his cult following, he was a singer-songwriter on the fringe of the Los Angeles music industry, chiefly through a chance association with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, who introduced Manson to record producer Terry Melcher. In an interview with Diane Sawyer, Manson stated that when he was aged nine, he set his school on fire. Manson was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven people, including the film actress Sharon Tate. Account 2. Ed Gein, a.k.a. Butcher of Plainfield, in 1957, after authorities discovered that he had exhumed corpses from local graveyards and fashioned keepsakes from their bones and skin. He also confessed to killing two women, tavern owner Mary Hogan in 1954 and hardware store owner Bernice Warden in 1957. Account 3. Gert Van Royen and his girlfriend, Joey Harhoff, South African pedophile and serial killer. None of the six little girls he murdered were ever found. He also has potential ties to procuring young boys for officials of the apartheid government. I think what makes this the most frightening to me is that one of the victims was the sister of a family friend of ours, and how police will come up with a new lead every few years, and then it just leads to nothing. It feels so hopeless, and there will never be closure for the families in their lifetimes. Account 4. The Golden State Killer Joseph James D'Angelo was a former police officer and former mechanic who committed at least 13 murders, 51 rapes, and 120 burglaries across California in late 90s. He is responsible for three known separate crime sprees throughout the state, each of which spawned a different nickname in the press, before it became evident that they were committed by the same person. Account 5. Hell's Bell. Bell Gunnis is thought to have killed at least 14 people, most of whom were men she enticed to visit her rural Indiana property through personal advertisements while some sources speculate her involvement in as many as 40 murders, making her one of the most prolific female serial killers in history. Account 6. Gary Rigway. 
Green River killer charged with 49 murders confessed to over 70. He was initially convicted of 48 separate murders committed between the early 1980s and late 1990s. As part of his plea bargain, another conviction was added, bringing the total number of convictions to 49, making him the second most prolific serial killer in United States history, according to confirmed murders. Most of Ridgway's victims were alleged to be sex workers and other women in vulnerable circumstances, including underage runaways. Before his identity was known, the media gave him his nickname after the first five victims were found in the Green River. Account 7. Dennis Nielsen. Acted all kind and concerned, got the men to come back to his flat before murdering them. Kept the bodies under floorboards until they had decomposed too much to gain sexual gratification from, and either burned the remains in the garden, first flat he lived in, or flushed them down the toilet, second flat. Flushing the remains is what led to his arrest, as they clogged the drain and someone was called to clear the blockage. Account 8. The Railway Killer in the Late 90s. He rode trains throughout North America, and many of his victims were in Texas, where I lived as a teenager. We had railroad tracks just behind our backyard, and we frequently saw people riding in open, empty cars. When it became apparent a serial killer was riding on trains in Texas, my parents got the house alarm fixed and then monitored, and my dad slept with a gun near his bed. Account 9. Richard Chase. Dude thought he was a vampire and that the government vaporized his blood. The solution? Kill people and rape some post-mortem and drink the blood. This one time he was almost caught, so he made himself a baby milkshake on the way. Edit. I believe the correct term would be baby smoothie, since he didn't add anything with milk. Account 10. Robert Hansen, champion hunter in Alaska who would kidnap sex workers, fly them into the wilderness, and then hunt them for sport. He was also a baker, hence the media nickname Butcher Baker, who had a wife and two kids and was an active member of the community. What is scary about him to me is he was an average Alaskan. No one would think it weird if you went missing several times a year to go fishing and hunting. It's the culture here. He was active for 12 years and killed at least 17 women. Edit. Little known fact, he was also a candlestick maker. He did it as a hobby. Account 11. Robert Hansen put her, Cindy Paulson, a 17-year-old prostitute and intended victim in his car, and took her to Merrill Field Airport, where he told her that he intended to take her out to his cabin. Paulson, crouched in the back seat of the car with her wrists cuffed in front of her body, saw a chance to escape when Hansen was busy loading the airplane's cockpit. While Hansen's back was turned, Paulson crawled out of the back seat, opened the driver's side door, and ran toward nearby 6th Avenue. She later told police that she had left her blue sneakers on the passenger side floor of the sedan's back seat, as evidence that she had been in the car. Account 13. William Bonin, a.k.a. the Freeway Killer, killed my childhood friend in 1980. He was 16. I was 15 at the time, and that is too young an age to wrap your head around having a friend a victim of a serial killer. It changed me. Edit, I am 55 years old now, and still when I think about it, it breaks my heart. His body was found in such a horrific manner. When you are 15 years old, you just can't fathom. But then life dishes some hard lessons, and the realization of it is manageable. Just barely, though. I was able to hear the news of Bonin execution by radio and breathed a sigh of relief, although I will never understand how Bonin found recruits to help in his killings. It's a... Account 12. I just read about Fred and Rose West, a married couple in the UK who collectively were among the most prolific serial killers in modern UK history. It is a grim tale of rape and incest and prostitution and brutal murders and dismemberment of family members and random strangers, some of whom they buried in the garden behind their house. It's a fascinating yet horrific story. Never understand how Bonin found recruits to help in his killings. It's a sad story. Account 14. Dean Coral. I almost puked when reading about the methods of torture he used on little boys. He was such an asshole that his teenage accomplice was the one that killed him, which revealed his 28-plus murders to the public. There is a haunting photo of an unidentified victim that was found in his accomplice's property years after they got busted. Nobody has any clue who the kid is, but the image of distress on his face, 
and the toolbox full of torture tools next to him have forever been burned into my mind. Account 15. One of the saddest stories is one of the boys he picked up was 14 years old and on his way home from the gas station. He was saving up bottle caps for recycling money to take a girl to the movie, and he never made it home. Imagine how high on life that kid was. He must have worked so hard to get the money together to take a pretty girl he probably had a crush on for a long time to the movies. He must have been so happy on the walk home. But then he ended up dying a slow and painful death. Shit makes me tear up. Edit. The boy's name was James Stanton Dramala. He was the very last boy that Coral killed. Account 1. The DC Snipers, John Allen Muhammad and John Lee Malvo. Not only were the killings completely random, people filling up with gas or walking in a parking lot, they started to move south, and I was still living in my hometown, Charlottesville, VA, so there was the fear they could make it that far south. Account 2. Robert Picton, piece of shit killed poor street-involved native women, and police knew. Also called the Canadian with the pig farm? So many serial killers choose prostitutes as their victims because they know a dead Sally in the alley gets so little attention, particularly if they are POC, one of the reasons it's believed Wayne Williams was able to kill so many children in Atlanta. I remember reading one of the profilers of the Green River Killer got angry with a detective because he referred to one of the prostitute victims as NHI, no human involved. Sex workers may have their own problems, but no one deserves to die the way Picton killed them. Account 3. There was a super interesting Unsolved Mysteries episode years ago where they posed a theory that the Unabomber and the Zodiac Killer were the same person, Ted Kaczynski. Seems way too wild to be true, but there are some startling coincidences that are hard to ignore. Two separate true crime researchers, I don't think they were actual police investigators, who came up with the same theory completely independent of one another, and eventually met and compared notes to find a lot of information that lined up. Some things I remember from the episode for those who don't want to watch or don't have Hulu, so spoilers below if you plan on watching the episode. In late 1967, the 25-year-old Kaczynski moves from Michigan and begins teaching mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley. Less than one year later, in the summer of 1968, the Zodiac killings begin. One of the two Zodiac killer survivors mentions that he said he was on the run and escaped from a prison up near Lincoln, Montana. Or that's where the cops were after him from. I can't remember specifically. This puzzled investigators because that clearly wasn't true and was a pretty random and specific place to mention. Years later, Kaczynski is caught and arrested by the FBI at his small cabin in the wilderness in Lincoln, Montana. In one of his ciphers sent to the police, Zodiac claimed if it was decoded, it would reveal his identity. Eventually, it was almost completely decoded and was a long, strange diatribe about killing and how he enjoyed it. However, the final 21 characters have never been decoded. Investigators suspect this might be his signature. Could those 21 characters be Theodore John Kaczynski? The ages match up pretty well with how old Zodiac was assumed to be and how old Ted was at the time. There is also a striking resemblance between the police sketch of what Zodiac looked like and photographs of Ted at that time. In his last letters to the police, the Zodiac killer beings talking about bombs, something he had never done before. He draws detailed diagrams of them and talks about how he will start using them on his next victims. He then vanishes altogether. A short time later, the Unabomber begins his bombings. Both Zodiac and the Unabomber liked to write letters to the police and press and taunt them. They also both had a mutual interest in mathematics and symbols and ciphers. Things like that. Like I said, I don't know that I believe it, but it's definitely an interesting watch for people who like these types of true crime mystery conspiracies. I do sort of feel like that would have come out after Kaczynski was arrested. Surely he would have taken credit for it if it were him, right? It's also worth mentioning there was nothing in the Unabomber's cabin to suggest he was the Zodiac. Edit. Added all the details I could remember from that episode. I might be missing a few. I know it's super weird, but I love falling asleep to old episodes of Unsolved Mysteries, LOL. It was like 4 a.m. one night when this one started auto-playing and it woke me up and had me fully invested in the whole thing. 
Account 4. Mr. Cruel, unsolved. He is an Australian serial rapist who abducted and sexually assaulted three girls and is the prime suspect of the abduction and murder of another young girl. After sexually assaulting his victims, he bathed them carefully to get rid of evidence. One victim described it as like a mother washing a baby. In one case, he took a second set of clothes from the girl's home to dress her before he let her go. This case makes me feel so uneasy. Account 5. I just finished Mindhunter the other day, so this question is interesting. It would be the killer of the Atlanta kids. Yeah, they arrested Wayne Williams, but he might not kill all of them. The case was never solved. Terrifying. Account 6. Even Milot. That MF just came off as a good-intentioned Aussie bloke, giving a lift to a foreign hitchhikers, which then he literally brutally murdered in a forest. There's so much uninhabited land here in Australia. The population only takes up 5% of the total land. Freaks me the fuck out to think about all the dead bodies that were never found and never will be found. Account 7. I remember watching a documentary on Bundy, and they mentioned that he had the type of face that could look very different, depending on what kind of beard, a haircut he had, or how much weight he had gained, lost. They showed a collection of different pictures of him, and it was uncanny. The guy was like a chameleon. It blew my mind that they were all pictures of the same guy. Account 8. For what it's worth, Leonard Lake and Charles Ung are the serial killers who disturb me most. I find the addition of torture, mutilation, and violent rape to murder to be particularly disquieting. Leonard Lake committed suicide soon after his arrest. Charles Ung is serving life on death row in the Big Q, San Quentin. He has displayed no remorse. They also had videotapes of the enslaved woman rubbing them down and crying. They told the women if they didn't appease them, then they would kill their family, which they already did. Count 9. The Killers of James Bulger. They were both only kids who killed another little kid. The murder was so horrific the police hasn't said what happened in its full. A documentary I saw on it used the powerful phrase, Rape is an understatement for what happened. And the thought of that happening to a four-year-old by two ten-year-olds is horrific. Even worse was in an interview was they said they killed him because he looked like Chucky. And after killing him, shoved batteries up his ass to see if he came back to life. Firstly, what kind of messed up parenting creates that? Secondly, F for the poor mothers. Thirdly, does this mean kids who have seen Chucky, God forbid, will kill any young kid with red hair? Account 10. Not a serial killer, but that Waukesha Slender Man stabbing always has really disturbed me. If you didn't know, two 12-year-old girls decided to take their same-age friend out into the forest to sacrifice her to Slender Man. They stabbed her 19 times, and the little girl barely survived by crawling to a nearby road. Happened not too far from where I grew up, just terrifying. Account 11. Madame LaLaurie. Sick, twisted, and revolting. She was the one in New Orleans, a wealthy woman who was torturing and murdering slaves in the most sadistic ways. Agreed. And another who got away with her crimes, not only at the time, but that so few people now know about what she did. They should make a movie about her. Maybe change just the ending so she gets her just desserts in some cinematic and crowd-pleasing way. Account 12. Ted Bundy was my mom's study partner at law school. She was tipped off by a professor that he was being investigated. After he was arrested and escaped, they found her home address in his jail cell. I think she was saved because she lived at home in a big house with a big family instead of in the dorms. Obviously, it freaks me the heck out. Edit. The other crazy part to the story is after the professor told my mom, stay away from Ted, she left the room crying and ran into my dad, who she knew a little. He saw she was upset and took her out to calm down. And that was their how I met your mother moment. So Ted Bundy could have prevented my existence. But in a way, he also caused my existence. Account 13. There's recently been a series in the UK on serial killer Dennis Des Nilsson. A Scottish killer who lived in London and prowled bars and streets for young men to entice back to his flat. He killed many people and was caught after a plumber found human bones and a mass of flesh in the drains. Turned out Des was dismembering his victims and trying to flush the remains. In his previous flat, he would burn and bury the remains, 
but his second flat was top floor of a three-story building, so resorted to flushing. The police found the remains of three men in bin bags in a wardrobe, as well as under a drawer in the bathroom, and a head in a large cooking pot on the stove. One killing which stood out for me was a young guy Dez found outside his property one day who was unwell. He helped the guy get to the hospital for treatment. Days later, the young man went back to thank Dez for saving his life, stayed for a drink, and Dez drugged, strangled, and dismembered him. This reminded me of Jeffrey Dahmer and the lad who escaped his flat to the police, who then delivered him back to Dahmer's flat. People in the world astound me. There will never be peace whilst people like this exist. Account 14. I just recently learned about Nathaniel Barjona, easily the most disturbing criminal I've read about. Today's modern day, Albert Fish, Barjona's interest in crime began when he attempted to strangle another child when he was only seven years old. Eventually, the sickness in his mind devolved so far that he would impersonate police officers in order to abduct, sexually harass, or sometimes kill his child victims. He was caught and released by police multiple times and eventually deemed not a credible threat to society. He later moved across the country and began cannibalizing children. It is likely that he fed bits of children to his friends and neighbors during cookouts. Absolutely horrifying case. Account 15. I had a friend do some time in El Dorado Prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. He was a trustee and was assigned to clean the maximum security block that held Dennis Rader, a.k.a. the BTK killer. He said that Rader would just stand at the cell window and stare at him. No words, no movement, just eyes wide open staring while he swept and mopped. Creepiest thing ever considered everything he did. Sometimes late at night I remember that story and get nervous. Account 1. A guy I used to work with at Best Buy. He would tell us stories about his time in Iraq and how much he would enjoy combat. He was a sharpshooter, and his stories would very clearly highlight his enjoyment in the lives he took. The last conversation I had with him was during a 4th of July work party where he expressed the thing he loves most about the holiday. He loved that everyone would automatically thank him for his service without knowing that the part he loved most about the service was the lives he took. He quit before the company could fire him. He's still out there and probably still showing off his tattoos and relishing in the mountains of praise he constantly gets for having passed military service. Account 2. No question. Richard Speck. He killed those eight nurses when I was a kid, nine years old, and I have never forgotten the headlines in the St. Louis paper showing the pictures of the nurses. It was the scariest thing I had ever seen, and it upset me for the longest time. Account 3. One of the most infamous and frightening serial killers, in my opinion, is the perpetrator behind the murder of Elizabeth Short, famously known as the Black Dahlia. Short's brutal killing remains unsolved to this day, leaving a haunting legacy of mystery and horror. Her severely mutilated body, with a Glasgow smile carved into her face, shocked the nation and sparked intense public interest. Despite extensive investigations, the killer has never been identified or brought to justice. The fact that such a heinous crime could go unpunished adds to the terror of the case. Short's tragic story, continues to captivate the public imagination, fueling countless theories and speculation about the identity of her killer. The unsettling possibility that the perpetrator may have evaded justice due to wealth and privilege only adds to the chilling nature of the case. Account 4. The one I knew, true long story, TLDR at the end. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. My siblings and I grew up taking piano lessons from a lady who attended our church. We would mow her lawn and other odd jobs to pay for the lessons since she was an older so-how lady who needed help around the house. Kind of like our adopted grandma. Well, during the long afternoons mowing and waiting for our turn for lessons, we got to know her neighbor. Dennis Rader was his name, generally considered a stand-up member of the community who was involved in the local Boy Scouts, city council, and more. Turns out he was BTK, which stand for Bind, Torture, Kill. We learned when he is as arrested and convicted that he killed like 10 women or something. Some of them he killed multiple times with reviving them and killing again. 
TLDR, our piano teacher's next door neighbor was BTK Dennis Rader. Account 5, Bruce MacArthur, the guy from Toronto, Canada. He would meet other mean on a gay dating app, bring them to his apartment, kill them, and chop them up, but it gets worse. He was a landscaper, so he would hide the bodies in people's backyards, and he did this for a few years. When caught, it was estimated that 11 were killed, but only 9 were found. I would hate if the police came to my door saying there was a chopped up person under my backyard. Police arrested him during one of his hookups, likely saved the other guy's life. Not that they handled the case very well from the start, unfortunately. Account 6. I'm very fascinated by serial killers, and why there are so many from California specifically. And I'm pretty sure I know most of the famous ones. I've noticed Russia has some seriously deprived ones, though. There's Andrei Chikatilo, the Rostov Ripper, killing over 50 people. A lot of them were kids. Pretty horrific details. And you should check out the picture from his trial. Then there's Alexander Pachushkin, the chessboard killer. Murdered 49 people, but tried to raise the count to 64 to mock the number of squares on a chessboard. Also terrifying to think about. These two were killing within the same time period. Account 7. The Iceman, Richard Kuklinski, dude had some profoundly fucked up ways of killing people, such as binding the victims and leaving them in caves to be eaten by rats. Read a really good book on him by Phil Carlo, who I believe was able to interview him for the writing of the book. He would kill anybody who rubbed him the wrong way over the smallest of things. He claims to have killed over 200 people. And while a good portion of it was for mob work, it was how he scratched that itch to take another life. Account 8. Ted Kaczynski. His manifesto is full of near-prophetic warnings about the negative implications of technological encroachment into everyday life. His lifestyle predicted future trends in minimalism and survivalism. His philosophy is eclectic in origin, yet cohesive in ideology. I find him tremendously relatable based on his writings. And then he sent bombs through the mail to blow up whoever happened to be working in the mailroom at a variety of airports and universities. He scares me most because he's not some seemingly alien, emotionless killer, but someone who I feel like I would meet and befriend in local community activism or at university. He was a genius in multiple areas, went to Harvard to study math at 16, got swept up in government LSD mind control trials while there, and over several years, came up with some highly socially conscious ideologies while simultaneously killing people. As someone who has always wanted to run away and live in self-sufficient isolation in a cabin doing psychedelics and living off the land, his story serves me a very personally relevant cautionary tale. Account 9. Arthur Shawcross is a new one I learned about through LPOTL, and he's pretty terrifying. He was from my hometown of Rochester, N.Y., Clearly remember the killings. He was another one who tried to maintain the mask of sanity, though the post-arrest interviews I've seen of him. You can see that mask slipping. Shed no tears when he died. Account 10. I would have to say Georgia Tan. She kidnapped and sold hundreds of babies and young children with help from her accomplices, refused to properly feed them and get them necessary medical treatment when they were sick. Kept them all crammed together in a room even when they had contagious illnesses, and killed the sickly ones and the ones she deemed undesirable. One such way she would dispose of them was she, or one of her workers at her request, would leave them outside in the sun to slowly bake to death. She was called the mother of modern adoption, and received heaps of praise from well-known public figures of the time, including Eleanor Roosevelt and she never got caught because she was in politicians' pockets as well as the police. Her horrible crimes and her true nature only came to light after she died from cancer, and everyone that worked for her spilled the beans once they found out. Every time I hear about that woman, I get sick to my stomach and get angry at the fact that nobody did anything to stop her. Not one person. Account 11. When my dad was around 14, 1964, he was walking home from a friend's house in Moston one day when a car pulled up alongside him. There was a man driving and a woman in the back seat, and they tried to get him in the car. Fortunately, a group of people walked around the corner at the same time, and my dad shouted and made a load of commotion, and the car drove off pretty quickly. 
To this day, my dad is convinced it was Brady and Hindley, and has often wondered how close he came to being a newspaper headline. Account 12. Although technically not a serial killer, the shit that Adam Lanza said to his victims during the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting shakes me to my core. A student who was interviewed by police who was hiding in a room next to the classroom where the majority of kids died said that when he pressed his ear against he wall the kids were hiding in the classroom's bathroom, he could hear Lanza screaming, shut the fuck up and look at me, to crying, screaming children. Another student heard one of his classmates yell, I don't want to be here. And Lanza replied, well, you're here, before opening fire. Doesn't help that Lanza is one of the most creepy and weird-looking MF I've ever seen. Account 13. The shoemaker, Joseph Callinger, gave me nightmares. The descriptions of his mental illness and his delusions, plus all the abuse he went through as a child, was too fucking much. He was a grade-A nutcase through and through. I wonder how much of it he even realized wasn't right. Account 14. Probably Fritz Harmon. Apparently, he killed quite a few young folks before chopping them up and disposing of the bodies. He killed them either by strangling them or ripping their throats out with his teeth. So that's horrifying. And then there were rumors he sold some of those body parts. He dismembered as meat. Account 15. The Oakland County child killer, who was never caught. It was very likely Chris Bush. The killing stopped after he, allegedly, committed suicide, but he had help in high places. The detail that does it for me? The fried chicken. If you know this case, you know what I'm talking about. Account 1. I don't normally post on Reddit, but I created an account just to comment on this. I grew up in Florida, unfortunately. Both of my parents also spent their youth here. My dad told me a story years ago that has stuck with me to this day. Back in the early or mid-80s, my dad, who was in his very early 20s at the time, and his good friend were out driving along I-95 late one night. There was a young woman thumbing for a ride, so they pulled over and picked her up. My dad said that she seemed very distant and somewhat upset at first, but he and his friend were very friendly and made small talk with her, and she seemed to lighten up a bit on the ride. She asked to be let out at the next exit, and they obliged. My dad said he's 99% sure the woman they picked up was Aileen Warnos. And somehow, that little bit of humanity they showed her was enough to keep them from becoming potential victims. He also made it a point to mention that she had a really tragic backstory. That really made me think, and it stuck with me even to this day. Account 2. I would say ear ons because he would commit a crime. Robberies, then rapes, then murders over the years watch the newspapers and listen to his cop buddies investigate the case, and then change his M.O. and or appearance in order to deliberately throw them off the trail. They said he was fat. He lost weight. He said he had long hair. He cut it. They said he only attacked people who lived in single-story homes. He immediately went for a couple sleeping on the second floor. He would steal a pair of earrings from one home and leave a single earring in the next home he broke into, in the rain gutter where it would be found months or years later, or sometimes not at all. Over all his crimes, it really seemed like he was just doing it for the joy of hurting people. There was no cool-down period after each attack. Sometimes he'd assault two or three people in one night, just because he felt like it. He just wanted to hurt people. He wanted to see how much he could hurt people and how far he could take it. They did eventually catch him, when his third cousin twice removed or whatever uploaded her DNA profile to a John Doe website and got a match to E.R. Ons's DNA from the 70s. Account 3. I'm surprised no one mentioned them. Dnipro maniacs. There were three guys in Ukraine, I believe, around 20 years old. They were killing around 15 people in absolute horrible ways, just waiting next to a road in a forest for their victims. The first victim was a 50-something-year-old grandfather who, despite having survived very nasty throat cancer, still went to work on his moped so he could feed his family. They hit him while he was driving by, took him into the woods, and attacked his head with a hammer. They even made jokes about how crazy it was that the dude was still breathing, even though a part of his brain was literally visible and his whole head face was destroyed. The worst part is they filmed this whole thing, and it is available on the Internet. Just a warning, NSFL Daunt, look it up. This will change your life for the absolute worst.
The craziest thing, even still, is that they came from rich families, and one kid's dad was a well-known lawyer who was friends with the president or something. He actually tried to claim that the hundreds of pictures and videos all have been edited and photoshopped to frame his son. The judge, of course, dismissed it and said the level of editing would need a multi-million dollar studio to fake it. As far as I know, they are still rotting in jail. Account 4. Randy Kraft very rarely mentioned in serial killer lore, but he was without a doubt one of the most evil people to ever exist. My husband's grandma worked with Randy Kraft while he was actively killing. She doesn't talk about it much, but she did say that she never suspected anything. The only thing that ever caught her off guard was that he'd put extra miles on the rental car when they had business trips, and she always wondered where he was going. Account 5. Not a serial killer, but the Cambodian Genocide seeing those rusted abandoned schools that used to be torture chambers. The killing fields out the countryside, in the middle of nowhere under a red sun sky. The everyday tools used for killing. Pickaxes, hammers, etc. It feels like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something. Like a rough horror movie slaughter rather than a methodical genocide like the Holocaust. Not that other genocides don't disturb me, there's just something different about this one. Account 6. I'm First Nations in British Columbia. What disturbs me is all the women that disappear along the Highway of Tears. I don't know if it's a serial killer or systematic kidnapping for human trafficking. Both scenarios are terrifying. My sister went camping for a week without telling anybody. We all didn't immediately panic because she does this kind of stuff once in a while, but those thoughts, you know, they drift through your mind. Having a boogeyman out there who preys on First Nations women is scary and we have to tell girls to look out because you never know that there is this one highway they should learn about. Account 7. Growing up in Illinois, it was John Wayne Gacy for me just for the proximity and my age at the time. Just sticks in my head as a scary mofo. Got close to him once while training to be a correctional officer and we went to Menard CC to shake down cells for training and some of our class shook down death row where he was. Also was close enough to speak to Richard Speck at one point when I worked at Joliet CC, of Prison Break and Blues Brothers fame. And I drove Rolando Cruz from Joliet to Menar once. He was later freed after he was proven innocent of killing a little girl named Janine Nicurico, SP. Account 8. You said killer, but I'm going to add serial rapists. Bill Cosby. The disturbing part is how well he had his outward persona mastered. Comparing him to, say, Harvey Weinstein, who didn't have himself under control, he was a master of disguise. And the most disturbing part about it is, in each case, who knew and kept it hidden. The victims needed voices who could speak for them because they were already tormented. Account 9. I'm a true crime aficionado, and I've read about a lot of serial killers. There's one that truly disturbed me, and that was Gordon Stewart Northcott of the Wineville Murders. The book The Road Out of Hell tells the story from the perspective of the sole survivor, Sanford Clark, which was actually Gordon's nephew. That tale is a lot to unpack, but it's very well done. Account 10. The little-known John Robinson. Was a cold case for a while. Sold one his victim's babies to his family member where he forged documents convincing them it was adoption. He was Sunday school teacher, scoutmaster, but also secret online and IRL leader of a cult that raped people. He is the most disturbing to me because he's an even more polarized version of Dennis Rader, BTK, yet no one talks about him. Psychopaths aren't as scary as same people who choose to be evil even with empathy. That's the worst kind of sadism. Account 11. Dennis Nilsson. Preyed on homeless men, took them back to his house for a drink. Murdered them by strangulation, then used their bodies as a masturbation aid and sat the corpses in chairs to have conversations with or lay in bed with them. Used to store them under the floorboards in his house. Got caught disposing the bodies because he chopped them up and flushed them down the toilet, blocking the drain. When it was cleared, they found out it was human flesh and busted him. ITV have recently shown a drama about his arrest and questioning and then his early months in prison. David Tennant plays him, and he is freaky. Account 12. Russell Williams. My father was in the Canadian Armed Forces, and it was unsettling that such a monster was also a commanding officer. We weren't on the same base at the same time. 
Reading about what he did to Marie-France Como, who was under his command, is beyond disturbing, as well as what he did to Jessica Lloyd and his other victims. There was no precedent for it. But his uniforms and medals were seized and destroyed, a symbol for the way the KF didn't just discharge him, but expelled him. Account 13. My Great Aunt, Juanita Hoyt. While living in New York, she killed all five of her kids while four of them were just babies. I think she had five kids. Basically, every time she had a kid, she ended up suffocating them to death at the age of two five, I think. She even tried blaming it on SIDS. Kind of disturbs me because that kind of person is in my family and mental health in my family isn't the best. Just glad my grandma and my mom love their kids. Simply look up her name and you will see everything about what she did. My grandma was requested to be interviewed about her sister Juanita, but she didn't want anything to do with the whole situation. My grandma then moved from New York to Texas with the kids he had at the time. Account 14. Moses Sithole, serial rapist murderer, 38 confirmed, 76 possible, in about the span of a year, currently serving 2,110 years imprisonment. Sithole targeted black women between the ages of 18 and 45 years old. Most of his victims were being interviewed for positions with Sithole's ersatz charity. Sithole would take them to remote fields where he would beat, rape, and murder them. They were generally strangled with their own underwear. He once inflicted a head wound on the two-year-old son of one of his victims and left him to die from exposure. Account 15. Rodney Alcala. He would strangle his victims and then resuscitate them before raping them. Roughly 130 women were believed to be murdered by him. And right in the middle of his spree, he was a contestant on the dating game TV show. Watching it with hindsight is creepy. Count 1. Alexander Spesitsev. This is a Russian maniac who brutally raped, killed, and ate children and women right in the apartment. His grandmother lured victims to him. She asked the victim for help, brought him to the door, and dragged him into the apartment, where hell began. When he was caught, a wounded, dying girl was found in the bathroom, who dismembered the corpse of her friend. The grandmother trapped three girls at a time. The other girl had already been eaten. A couple of days later, the girl who survived then died. What scared me about this maniac is that I could easily imagine myself falling into this trap of his grandmother. Account 2. In Austrian prison, there is the so-called Ice Princess, who killed two of her exes and put them in concrete in her cellar. She has gotten a life sentence, but the thought of her makes me shiver. Account 3. East Area Rapist, who went on to become the Golden State Killer and we now know as Joseph James D'Angelo. This guy would stalk his victims for weeks leading up to the attacks, along with many other houses, while he was working as a police officer. When he attacked, he was relentless and would stay in the house for hours messing with his victims. When cornered, he would kill without a second thought. Account 4. I was a child in England when the Moors murders took place. The Moors murders were carried out by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, between July 1963 and October 1965, in and around Manchester, England. The victims were five children. As a kid growing up in England at the time, the part that I remember was that these creeps tape recorded one child as they tortured and killed them, and then sent the tapes to the mother. True psychopaths. They were the most odious and pernicious scum that ever suffered to crawl upon the face of this earth. Account 5. Ward Weaver murdered two teen girls, Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis, just down the street from where I used to live. Very creepy, because he put their bodies in an oil drum, buried it, and cemented over it. He was interviewed about the news on disappearances before he became a suspect. Account 6. H.H. H. Holmes. He built a giant hotel with death traps in it. It's truly horrifying. Despite his confession of 27 murders, including some people who were verifiably still alive, Holmes was convicted and sentenced to death for only one murder, that of business partner and accomplice Benjamin Pitzer. It is believed he also killed three of Pitzer's children, as well as three mistresses, the child of one mistress and the sister of another. Much of the lore attached to Holmes concerns the so-called Murder Castle, a three-story building he commissioned in Chicago. 
Details about the building, along with many of his alleged crimes, are considered exaggerated or fabricated for sensationalistic tabloid pieces, with some accounts estimating his body count could be as high as 133 or even 200. Many of these inaccuracies have persisted due to the combination of ineffective police investigation and hyperbolic yellow journalism of the period, which are often cited as historical record. Account 7. Derek Todd Lee. I lived there during his killing spree. Our PE classes turned to self-defense. Women were told not to wear your hair up, he can grab it. Don't wear a skirt, easier access. Carry mace. Carry your keys between your fingers, arm yourself. His victims were of different races and vast age differences. He killed in multiple cities. No one was safe. And their murders were unbelievably gruesome. I'll never forget the day he was arrested. Every woman in South Louisiana breathed a sigh of relief. Account 8. Personally, I find serial killers fascinating, so I'll share a story my mom told me a while back. My mother grew up in California and lived in a very peaceful neighborhood, as there were lots of families and elders. When she was around 10, sometime in the mid-80s, she was woken up by a faint noise coming from her brother's room. She has three that share the same room. At first, she wasn't too concerned about it, but she couldn't sleep as it kept going. She finally got up and walked into her brother's room. She saw a hand reaching in through the window and trying to unlock the door. The way the house was set up is that the windows in her brother's room had no glass, just bars, as it was meant to be a sort of back room. She screamed as soon as she saw the hand and watched in terror as a figure ran off, jumping the brick fence in the process. When my grandparents and uncles asked her what happened, they all thought she was crazy. But when they went outside to water the plants, she noticed a brick was missing from the fence, most likely from when the person jumped the fence. The next day, there was a report of a murder in the exact same neighborhood as her. The victims ended up being that of Richard Ramirez, the L.A. Night Stalker. To this day, she believes her and her family would have been dead had it not been for her waking up to the noise. TLDR. My mom and her family were almost victims of the Night Stalker. Account 9. Nathaniel Bar Jonah. He was a convicted serial child molester and attempted murderer. He has never actually been proven to have killed anyone, but was convicted of the attempted murder of children many times. He has also been connected to the disappearances of many young boys and girls. When police raided his home, they found coded journals that detailed his victim list and kill record, as well as accounts of the killing and eating of children. There were also recipes for chili, burgers, and pot pie that called for human meat, as well as directions for butchering human body parts. His day job was as a short order cook. He used to hold neighborhood cookouts and serve burgers, spaghetti, casserole, and meat pies to the people in his neighborhood. There are many accounts of the neighbors that ate at these gatherings, noting that the meat had an odd taste. He's the prime suspect in the disappearances of many children. Fortunately, he died in prison in 2008. Account 10. Dene Propetrovsk maniacs. They killed 21 people, one of which was pregnant, and they cut the unborn child out of her womb. They were only 19 years old when they committed the murders. Account 11. My father was murdered when I was three by a woman named Jeannie Braun. His name's Jeremy Burt. Mine's Mackenzie. Look it up if you don't believe me. Not only did she get away with it, but she did it again and killed her husband. He went out for milk one day and never returned. She tried to do it a third time, but her latest husband went to a hospital before she could finish the job. They divorced and she forced him to sign a contract stating he wouldn't talk about anything that happened during their marriage. She was a lawyer, so she could genuinely ruin his life. If you want the whole story about how my father went missing, I can write it out. I just doubt anyone will see this. She's still walking free. I'm 17 now, and I'll be 18 in March. She may not be a serial killer or a famous killer at that, but she ruined my life and took my father from his mother, sister, brother, our entire family with no remorse, and she's still walking free. Account 12. Probably to late, but Carl Panzram. Went around the country killing and causing as much pain as possible to everyone he met. What disturbed me the most was that his one goal was causing as much hurt as possible. He raped kids in front of their siblings, started fires, all sorts of crap. Account 13. 
David Berkowitz, a.k.a. Son of Sam. He was a really sick man, crazy to the point of no return. Shot and killed a lot of young couples in New York, he chose his victims seemingly randomly, and after getting caught, he blamed his neighbor's dog. That is, the dog talked to him and influenced his actions. Account 14. I live in Canada. The most disturbing shit that's happened in the last few years was the killer Bruce MacArthur. He killed a lot of people and hid their remains in people's plant pots in their gardens. From what's been found so far, he was a gardener. Account 15. Paul Bernardo. I was 14. One of his victims was found beside a road I'd driven down a few hours before. Another victim was a friend of a friend. It was so local and the victims were so normal. I remember our high school soccer coach figuring out how to get everyone home without anyone being left alone after practices. It was like the game with the fox, the goose, the wheat, and the river crossing. 